A very, very good morning to you all. Genelish, with the collaboration of Gender Equality Foundation and the support of European Union, welcome you to this symposium on the theme Democratic Consider Consolidation, Women's Agency, Voices and Perspectives. As we strive for progress and inclusivity in our democratic system, it is imperative to acknowledge and address the persistent underrepresentation of women in political leadership roles. Women make up half of the global population, yet their presence, unfortunately, is influencing political decision making remain disproportionately low. This disparity not only undermine principles of equality and justice, but also deprive our society of, the, of diverse perspectives, innovative solutions and inclusive governance. Since the first national election in 1967 to date, there has been 18 female ministers, as you can imagine. They, also those ministers uh, have had a few mandates. You will see in our leaflet here uh, all about the different data which might come in useful. The symposium is a space of engagement on critical issues affecting women's lives, particularly women's political participation, not merely as voters, but as decision makers and legislators. A very special celebration to our, to our highly esteemed women politicians who are here, those who are currently in office, as well as those who were here in the past. You have all contributed to where we are today. Mauritius had made great advances on women's emancipation, and for this, we, as civil society, wish to congratulate you and say thank you very much. You are fully aware that assuming the role of a woman politician is a highly patriarchal context is not easy. You have summoned the many barriers that women generally face to occupy those important positions, but research shows that difficulties persist. In Rodrigues, there are five women MPs at the regional assembly, which consists of 17 members. Of the five women, one of the commissioner and one is minority leader, which is equivalent to the leader of opposition in Mauritius. For the first time in 22 years of existence of the regional assembly, there's a woman minority leader and deputy leader in her political party. The, 2000, the 2016 amendment of the RRA Act introduced a gender quota of 30%. Since then, all parties competing for election have listed at least 30% of women as candidates. Achieving gender parity in politics requires concerted efforts at multiple levels. An enabling environment that promotes gender equality, inclusivity, and zero tolerance for discrimination and violence against women in politics is crucial. This includes implementing legal frameworks that guarantee equal rights and opportunities for women to participate in political lives without fear or prejudice. The stride made on women's emancipation could not possibly happen without the support and openness of mind of certain male leaders, women's movement and civil society groups. To them too, we say a big thank you and bravo. But despite the, achievement ma the achievements made, we have a number of challenges remaining. The most important one, perhaps, being the persistent underrepresentation of women in politics and spheres of decision making. We have just celebrated 56 years of independence, 32 years of our republic, and yet women are still heavily underrepresented in the political arena, with huge implication on, on our democratic and women's rights. Mauritius has signed and ratified a number of international conventions speaking to the importance of women's political rights and participation in decision-making, but Mauritius fails 
to implement some of the commitments undertaken. At Genderlinks, we are fully conscious of the fact that Women Voices Agency and perception, perceptives are central to democracy and what the latter can deliver in terms of development. Looking at the increasingly turbulent and uncertain world that we are living in, we at Genderlinks are worried that the concern expressed by the, the UN Secretary General and many other regarding the risk of gains made on SDG 5, eroding rapidly may become true. Here in the Republic of Mauritius, we are already seeing many of women's rights as human rights being infringed upon. We are not, however, suggesting that the mere increase in numbers of women in the legislature will automatically solve the multifaceted problem face, but we do believe that a minimal critical mass of women can make a huge difference. I have no doubt that we, we will learn so much more as, uh, on this, as well as the different facets of the uh, gendered political ecosystem when the study that we, are, uh, with, we recently commissioned on the enhancing of women's participation in politics led by no other than Professor Sheila Benoari, merci Sheila, is completed in July. I am aware that many of you present here today are responded to this study and I want to say a big thank you because uh, you participated in the focus group with Sheila and uh, her team. And uh, we are really looking forward to the validation workshop uh, finding uh, around July, August. We shall have, have the benefits of some preliminary findings during the panel discussion later this morning. As the lead speaker, setting the tone to the debate, we have Dr. Amas Tanen, merci, uh, former Minister of Finance, also an expert in elections and electoral reform. Prior to the panel discussion, we have a short video intervention from Pamela Paten, UN Specialist Re Special Representative of the, of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflicts, who brilliantly depict various forms of gender inequality, starting with the global scene, to then address the gross democratic deficit that Mauritius is experiencing as a result of women uh, underrepresentations in politics. We cannot thank her enough. And uh, also, the program also includes the voice of the youth, which is extremely important for gender links and also for this uh, uh, symposium, cap capturing the sentiments on politics and the inclusion of women and youth. Lis listening to them should be food for thought uh, through an action. And then uh, we also have uh, the pleasure to have Dr. Rukaya Kasenali and Dr. Azagen Changana, who both agreed uh, to be here with us as co-moderators, and uh, they are both experts on democracy and political communication. So thank you very much for that. We will have a session of question and answer after the, uh, when we're having the symposium. In many ways, the ongoing research that today's even builds on the EUGL Raisonné campaign uh, which uh, happened a couple of years back, transforming the male-dominant patriarchal space, you would conquer, takes so much more than just a campaign initiated by one or two organizations or individuals. Hence, the petition, you've heard about it, you've seen it on the social media, is a study and the humble request of civil society to synergize to claim for women political rights um, it's, it's for us absolutely imperative through Gender Links and the Gender Equality Foundation to wish you to invite those who have not signed the petition and yet to do so and to ensure that members of your family and friends do so as well. It is also in solidarity that we will be able to change this mindset and help in transforming our society towards greater inclusion and diversity, thus consolidating our democracy. Before I end, 
I wish to thank you all for taking your time of your busy schedule. I know it's a Saturday, and it's a it's a uh, for the the diverse uh, NGOs, think tanks, and organisations who are supporting this uh, symposium and the petition. I wish to recognize the full support of the Think Tank Mauritius Society Renewal, uh, chaired by President Kassam Utim, who sadly couldn't be with us. Uh, I also wish to recognize the full support and office of the Electoral Commission, Mr. Irfan Maman, uh, the Electoral Commissioner himself, uh, who's a strong supporter of this, pari of this uh, parity. Others, of course, you will recognize yourself, and a big thank you to you all for being here. And now I leave, it's a really great pleasure to invite Mohini Bali, founder of Gender Equality, Equality Foundation, to address us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anushka. Honorable Anquetil, Member of Parliament, Members of Diplomatic Corps, Distinguished Panelists and Moderators, the Director of Gender Links herself, Distinguished Guests, Dear Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen, all protocol observed if I've missed anyone. A very good morning to you all. We meet today in the month of March, the 30th of March, in the context of International Women's Day. And it's important that we remember that the month of March globally is recognized as the month of human history and women's victory. March is also a month of celebrating women from all the walks of life, including all those unsung feminists whose ongoing advocacy for women's rights over the last decades has resulted in the status that all women enjoy today. It is therefore within this backdrop that the Gender Links and the Gender Equality Foundation deem it fitting to celebrate women parliamentarians, the present one and former ministers and members of parliament. You know, because really, if it wasn't to you through your leadership, inspiration, determination and resilience, we wouldn't have seen so much of development in regard to women's status because you really contributed to the overall development of women. International Women's Day takes place on the 8th March annually and is no longer considered a women's issue, but a call for collective activism to create a change for a just world for women. Today's event is precisely about the synergy of gender links and the Gender Equality Foundation, which are both working together for gender justice. It is becoming increasingly important that collective actions among civil society organizations be promoted as pathways for the attainment of gender equality. Ladies and gentlemen, we have in our, in our midst today women politicians. Again, I would say whose inspiration and resilience have really been remarkable. You made history, you changed the norms, and you proved that the political space is not the monopoly of men. You added your voice and uh, value added to the key decisions that have been impactful on women's livelihoods as well as those of your constituents. You challenged the misconception that we cannot, women cannot do politics and that it's a monopoly of men. You challenge the misconception that women are unfit for politics and come under pressure when called upon to manage their personal and political life. The Gender Equality Foundation applauds all of you for making the difference and wish you well for all your future endeavors. We are, however, fully conscious that uh, despite the gains, despite women in politics, the overall participation of women in the legislature remains exceedingly low. Parity in the political domain is far from over. And gendering the legislature 
seems to be very far away. The theme written for today's symposium speaks on how best to explore our views that fosters a gender equitable parliament. Allow me at this point in time, ladies and gentlemen, to share with you the overall mandate of the Gender Equality Foundation, which is about two years old now, which is well aligned to today's symposium. The foundation seeks to involve male engagement as a necessary means to challenge the structures, belief, beliefs, practices, and institutions that sustains men's privileges. Our mission is to transform unequal power relations between men and women for the benefit of all. Fully conscious that men and boys constitute half our population, they cannot be excluded from the gender equality discourse. It is often said that men are responsible for gender inequality, but our foundation firmly believes that they also form part of the solution. They have the potential to be the game changers for gender equality. Hence, our flagship project, Men as Lies. The call of Jeff to Men today is to get engaged for the increased presentation of women in parliament. The board is in your court. I look at the men, but very few in the room. But I address myself to you. I say the board is in your court because eh? I'm just trying to count up. OK. So the, men, the board is in your court. I'm here referring to the next general elections where men will have to play a critical role to ensure a gender balanced parliament. We all know the challenges women face when they decide to enter politics which still remains a male-dominated domain. Women need to overcome the hostile environment, which include intimidations, threats, unwelcoming remarks, verbal violence, and harassment, and mudslinging about their personal life. Today's impression is, in fact, marks the continuation of a journey aimed at sustaining women's advocacy for more women in politics. Prior to being filled as a as candidates for elections, women's agency must more than ever before be strengthened through their own initiatives, energy, solidarity, and collective voices. They need to be bold and move beyond the rhetoric of simply increasing the number of tickets in the next general elections. Women should ensure that they have the agency to be the voices of all women and ensure that their needs concerns and aspirations of women are fulfilled. The political agency of women point out to major obstacles that erode their entry in politics. Hence, unless women get mobilized and instead in solidarity, you will not be able to advance the cause of women's empowerment and gender equality. Women have the responsibility to create spaces for their voices to be heard. Women should also be able to to nullify demeaning words, as well as refrain from belittling other women who aspire to join politics, because this would mean an attack on women's political voice and presence. We all know the benefits and gains that women's empower movements have brought to the forefront due to the advocacy. But we also note the loss of vibrancy of these women's movements over the last decade. Alliance building amongst women's movement matters a lot. We also owe the youth our voices and support because they represent the future. If women want to secure a future that they want, that is in gender equal society, amplifying their voices remains a sine qua non. It is therefore calls for maintaining the power of effectiveness of women's collective activism. Ladies and gentlemen, this conclusion call for democratic consolidation, which is all about a call for addressing the grave democratic deficit. Let us therefore pledge to walk the talk and enlist men as allies for gender equality. Let us reinvigorate the women's movement by harnessing the potential of youth as catalysts for change. Let us reflect on the establishment of a women's caucus which will be a platform that would allow women to get and share ideas on their overall women's empowerment. In fact, we are the ones who know what must be done for democratic consolidation. 
We must commit to stand in solidarity. We need to chart out our next steps to attaining gender parity in the political sphere. And hence, the time starts today, and I request all of you to sign the petition of which, to which the Director of Gender Links just referred to. Thank you to the Director for Gender Links to have given the Gender Equity Foundation a platform to be with you and make this, uh, uh, this collaboration a success and we, I'm sure that this collaboration will reap further dividends. Thank you to the team who, through your constant team spirit, made it this event happen. Thanks to the agency and the media for promoting today's event. I also wish to convey my thanks to the panelists and moderators who will shortly be sharing their insights on the thematic of the symposium. It is worth flagging out the gender balance of today's panel. I don't see Mr. Satyajit Bulel yet, maybe he'll join us. Uh, we have male speakers who represent gender champions. I'm addressing myself to you, Mr. Stenen. Uh, so you are the champion today for gender equality. <laughs> and this reminds me, and this reminds me, of course, of a quote of Desmond Tutu, who said, and I quote, it is by standing up for the rights of women and girls that we truly measure up as men, and good. So you are the hero, okay? And I have no doubt that you stand up for gender equality. Ladies and gentlemen, a gender balanced approach for women's political empowerment is what Jeff advocates for, believes in, and defends. Anything less than that would amount to grave democratic deficit. I thank you all for your attention and wish you a fruitful day. Thank you. Wow, merci beaucoup, Mouini. So the head of development cooperation of European Union delegation to Mauritius and uh, Seychelles, uh, Mr. Milko Van Gogh, uh, could not be with us uh, today, so he sent his speech via video. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Uh, my name is Nuno Kofaro. I'm the head of cooperation and chartered affair at Lisbon, the EU delegation to, uh, to Mauritius. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you, even at a distance by video and to talk with you and say a few words about uh, the European Union and its involvement with the issue of gender in Mauritius but also worldwide. One of the things that I've been asked to talk about is about the involvement of uh, women in politics in Mauritius. We all know that Mauritius has made good strides, strides forward in that respect, um, but we're not, we're not quite there yet, although we know that improvement course, uh, certainly in uh, women's participation in Parliament, where in 2050, if my figures are correct, we were approximately around the women participation, that is women elected to Parliament, of 11.5%. In 2090, that mounted already up to 80%, which is bad. We're not quite there yet. Uh, when in politics, in, uh, in government politics, in the cabinet, we, re we commend the prime minister for choosing a fifth woman minister. On, on a total of uh, 23 cabinet ministers, five are now women, and that is uh, in a very, in, going in a very good direction, 21%. But we're hoping for close to 50%. Uh, because Russian women, as it is, are still underrepresented in politics. Uh, that is one of the reasons why we are very pleased and proud to be supporting the organization GenderLinx through since December 2020 with a project entitled Advancing Gender Equality and Youth Inclusion in the Republic of Mauritius. With the upcoming general election, we believe this support in GenderLinks is really timely and we hope it can make a difference in the political sphere. 
Uh, a few words now on the European Union and the policy framework within which it works. Uh, we do have a gender strategy that covers the European Union and all its external action with Mauritius. We have a, a gender action plan and uh, women in politics uh, in, 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 in increasing increasing their involvement, increasing the state of women in politics is one key objective. We regularly speak with the people of Mauritius. We do that through the uh, through government channels. We also do that with uh, uh, the wide wide array of non-governmental organizations that we have in, here in Mauritius who are also working on uh, the emancipation of women and girls uh, in the country. We have very fruitful deliberations and on a very regular basis with the Ministry of Gender and Welfare. And we have contacts, very good contacts with uh, uh, organizations such as your own organizations of you that uh, gathered today for this gender symposium. Um, we welcome the gender links campaign of Pisti and Kota. I hope I, I said that well, but more than members. Uh, we congratulate Jamalinks for this engagement, encouraging women to, uh, to participate in politics. Uh, there really is no good reason why women should not be uh, in politics, but we know uh, that there may be social, sometimes economic reasons, uh, social norms, cultural norms that can be behind it that discourage the participation of women in politics. Uh, obviously, that is not the same as the situation should be. Uh, women account for more than half of the country's uh, population and they represent an invaluable uh, resource, just like men. Uh, and they need to bring their skills and expertise to the table. Uh, I would say though that uh, you can work with quotas, uh, they're not the be all and end all of it. Uh, they should certainly not be a maximum. Some countries in the world have more, much more than 50% of women in their parliaments, uh, and uh, gender quotas are just an indication. We hope that they are maybe to stimulate participation and nothing else. Does that mean that? Uh, uh, the European Union, which is really promoting the gen uh, women participation, does that mean that we are perfect? No, not at all. Uh, even in the European Union, uh, with, which has very clear policies and strategies in place, uh, we're currently at a broad average of about 30% of women in Parliament. Uh, not nearly enough, if you ask me. But we're working on it, and we're keen to work on it with our partner countries and with the people in our partner countries, including uh, the, the people in the general symposium today. I thank you for your attention, and I uh, wish you very, very fruitful deliberations. Thank you very much. From the United Nations headquarters in New York, I have the honor to welcome uh, Pramila Patten, Mrs. Pramila Patten, who is Mauritian born and unfortunately who couldn't be with us, as you can imagine. It's a bit of a long journey for its symposium. And uh, she is the UN Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict. So let's watch her video, which she, uh, I mean, we were really impressed. Uh, when she sent it to us. Thank you very much. Warm greetings and thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I commend the Gender Equality Foundation and Gender Links on this important initiative to enhance women's participation in politics. I'm speaking to you from the headquarters of the United Nations in New York, where record numbers of civil society organizations are engaged in the Commission on the Status of Women. They have come here to remind the world of the relevance of gender equality to social stability, democracy and peace at a time of great global turbulence and change. Many have come to bear witness to the horrors of war, with women trapped in war zones, continuing to pay the highest price for decisions made by men 
who still dominate the corridors of power and councils of war. As we scan the political horizon, we see conflicts rage, coup erupt, human rights trampled, and gender equality gains reversed. Cascading crises are turning the clock further and further back on women's rights, while mil militarization is on the march and democracy is in retreat. The global trend of backlash against gender equality is manifest in rising reprisals against women's rights defenders, politicians, and journalists, and in the reassertion of authoritarian and traditional values at the expense of women's agency and autonomy. Extremists are sowing division and distrust through disinformation and fanning the flames of misogyny. Patriarchal ideology and rigid gender hierarchies normalize inequality and violence. Whereas societies that value women and men equally are safer, healthier, and more prosperous. The sustainable development goals require us to empower women, eliminate gender-based violence, and foster peaceful, just, and inclusive societies that leave no one behind. This agenda is premised on the understanding that no society can achieve its full potential unless women and girls are able to achieve theirs. Yet, gender-based discrimination and violence remain the most pervasive and least punished human rights violations globally setting back the course of equality and the consolidation of democracy and peace. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a time when the pursuit of peace, democracy, and gender equality has once again become a radical act. The imperative of inclusion demands an urgent rebalancing of power and resources, beginning with a concerted push for women's political empowerment. Women are a critical constituency for peace and an engine of economic growth. Yet, women cannot hold up out the sky if they are trapped beneath glass ceilings. As we trace the arc of women's equality, we see that their voices and votes matter, that transformative change is possible, and the fight for inclusive democracy is a feminist cause. There is a link between equality in governance and quality in governance. More representative institutions are more responsive and legitimate, and only through a gender lens can we see the full picture of any situation. Nonetheless, everywhere we look, there remains a high barrier to women's political participation. A barrier built from bricks of bias, stereotypes, stigma, harmful social norms, discriminatory laws, and the threat and use of violence. We must dismantle this barrier brick by brick and ensure zero tolerance for gender-based violence, harassment, and hate speech against women in politics, both on and offline, which is used to silence and suppress them. While the share of women parliamentarians is increasing globally, so is the level of violence and harassment against them. For too many women, this has become the price of participation. We must also remember that the struggle to close the gender gap in politics is harder for historically marginalized women, whether on the basis of race, ethnicity, economic status, or sexual orientation and gender identity, and their representation lags furthest behind. Article 7 of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women which Mauritius ratified in 1984, requires states parties to take measures to eliminate discrimination against women in political and public life. Over the past half century, since the independence, Mauritius has made great strides in advancing gender equality and women's rights, though the political arena remains largely male-dominated. I therefore support the ideas being discussed at this symposium namely to launch a national campaign for gender parity in politics and to mobilize a civil society gender focus, focus. I also support the adoption of electoral quotas as one of the most efficient ways to correct historical gender imbalances. Women parliamentarians and political leaders 
serve as role models to empower other women to pursue their aspirations. Indeed, the next generation cannot be what they do not see. In Mauritius and around the world, women in politics have the power to empower. Although the Constitution of Mauritius guarantees the equality of all citizens and ensures that women have the same legal rights as men, various forms of overt and covert discrimination impede their exercise in practice. Women continue to shoulder the bulk of domestic and care duties, leaving them time poor, underpaid, undervalued, and overburdened. We also see that the majority of critical cabinet portfolios related to defense, the economy, and energy sector continue to be exclusively held by men. More inclusive solutions benefit us all. The contribution of every individual is needed to solve the complex social, political, economic, and security challenges of our time. All countries must strive to replace strong men with strong institutions, bullets with ballots, and investment in the instruments of warfare with greater spending on human welfare and social services. As Eleanor Roosevelt, the architect of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, stated, human rights are not just abstract ideas. They are tools with which we create a way of life. The push for gender parity in politics is not just a matter of, e of equality, but ultimately a matter of justice and human rights. Thank you all for your attention and shared commitment in this course. Yeah, so we, it's quite amazing having uh, the message of Pamela like that, and uh, she makes us so proud. So we have uh, also a video done um, for, by the youth, uh, La Voix Banzen in politics, and youth are such a vital force, so let's listen to them, to our youth. Il n'y a pas de nouveauté. A... C'est vrai qu'on voit beaucoup de MP, de PPS, c'est déjà bien, mais pourquoi pas les cosmétiques des ministres Pourquoi pas du sang nouveau à l'époque Vis-à-vis de Great Things et Vis-à-vis de Game Changer. Je pense réellement qu'il faut des, beaucoup plus de jeunes, beaucoup plus de femmes, tout simplement parce que. Souvent, quand c'est un ami tout pareil, tout blanc, bonnet, 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 blanc, puis au moins, en tant que madame, qui est entrepreneur, qui est jeune, euh, et qui maman aussi, euh, il y a autant que sa représentativité, même de nous que maman, il est aussi égal en, en politique, ce qui ne m'a pas trouvé aussi. Mais tout, en fait, c'est déjà une présentation de toute ma sensibilité de manière générale. Uh, 
c'est bien de venir un peu se traîner, c'est bien de venir à la maison. Hein. Mais j'aurais fait plus de training, training, que training. Que si je vais être après la première minute, c'est que je me dis, franchement, voilà, moi, mon rêve, c'est de devenir premier ministre, je m'aille du monde, je m'aille du monde, je m'aille et que je passe mon chemin. Selon moi, il essaye. Mais peut-être que vraiment avoir un autre focus, finalement, c'est pas fait. C'est quoi le but final C'est juste pour dire ou c'est vraiment pour faire ben, visiblement non, parce que sinon tu peux énerver les jeunes, tu peux énerver les malades, ils disent une question de volonté finalement. Tu ne peux pas faire assez parce qu'il y a un accompagnement estimé qui est déjà ouvert exprès pour un malade, pour qu'ils soient capables de participer, pour qu'ils soient capables de faire des savoirs dans le domaine de votre de manière générale. Donc j'ai essayé, non Parce que sinon, je suis un peu troublé, mais c'est sûr que parce qu'il va être politique. C'est pas le marque de politique qui vous a aidé pour faire tout ça pour les gens. C'est plutôt aux jeunes, aux postes progressistes, aux postes féministes de faire vous et de faire des choses plus tard pour mettre sur le marque de politique. Vous pensez ça, c'est de tonne, vraiment? qui va nous aider à se penser aujourd'hui et il est super important. There's something qui m'a pas dit à Zot et c'est important. We also have Rodrigue connected with us live. Mm -hmm. uh, donc Rodrigue en connexion avec nous live. Uh, Lorenzo Zoom. Uh, I don't know if you can see them, uh, l'équipe. Uh, please show us Rodrigue a little bit. We'd like to say hi to them. Non? Vous n'êtes pas connecté? Ok, we'll try to, to organize that later. Euh, donc là, ça fait moi vraiment plaisir, Rama, pour demander euh, toi, viens là, and talk to us a little bit about that amazing. Dis-moi, nous pas présenter, nous la représente lui parce qu'il est une figure extraordinaire. Merci Rama, tu es là. Thanks a lot. Merci. Je l'ai. Yeah. Comme il va dans le. Hi. Hi everybody. Look, when, when my good friend Sheila asked me to make a presentation to set the background, I must say I hesitated for a very simple reason. Whatever I'm going to tell you, I made a presentation 22 years ago <laughs> when I submitted the same text to the Sachs Commission. So this shows you not how frozen, but how deep frozen uh, we have been on this particular issue. So I was doing in four sequences. The status, where we are, I think uh, this leaf first, tell it all, but I will give you some slight variation on that theme. Second, why there is this democratic deficit. Third, why representation matters. I think the excellent speech you know, by Camilla says it all. It's about human rights, it's about democracy, it's about the morality, it's about you know, having more informed judgment and better judgment. And last but not least, what can you do? And if you could put the title of my presentation, Yes, so you can see, uh, I, I try to be, I don't know whether provocative or thought provoking, you know, between continuing to whistle in the wind <laughs> or fight vigorously for your rights. Now, we have been whistling in the wind for a very long time, let's be very honest uh, about it. And there's been a lot of rhetoric, a lot of panegyric rhapsodies. We love you, but they are constrained, we cannot make space for you. So I think the time for this is behind us. Otherwise, you will have to wait for 150 years, you know, on the basis of my mathematics for you to reach the years. So, I don't know who's going to be there. Okay. <laughs> so, the, the status is, so, no presence, no voice. That's very important. In fact, you've got any free asset. 
you've got your voice, you've got your action, and more importantly, you've got your work. That's very important if you want to make success. So, so achieving gender parity in political life is very far off on current trends. It will take, I went into my maths, it will take about 135 years. And don't ask me how I reach this figure. We have neither equal nor effective representation of women in politics. Women excluded from important decisions that shape society and concern them. And, and look at this one. You know, it's amazing. Now, I think someone said you're underrepresented in most senior positions. I always used to tease my good friend, Shana Baku, why you can't become a different minister, more important minister than being minister of the family or minister for women. Why not minister of finance? Why not minister of foreign affairs? You know? So, and you see that, you see that everywhere. You know? And, and if you look, you know, I get invited to speak on this in Africa. And I'm a bit ashamed when I do that because if you look at the full dimension of gender equality, Mauritius does extremely well in three of them. Economic opportunity is improving. You know, in global business, most of the jobs now go to women. My CEO is a lady. My goal is gender parity 50 50. And in terms of education, Again, I keep telling people, you know, women do better at CPE, at SC, at HSC, at, if you come and ask me a question, what is the best demographic for global business? It's women, you know? I can even go and segment it, you know, because look, uh, uh, we do this stuff with just us. In terms of life expectancy, 76 against 71, so you live longer. So on these three indices, of uh, what I would call social economic progress, you do better. And the only one where we are awful, really awful, is basically political representation. I think everybody knows about that, 50.5, you know, and only 8% of MP. And we are one of the few countries in the world where we have less than 10% of MP. You will be aghast when I show you countries that do better than us. Please. Look at this figure, you know. And now the gentleman from the EU was saying that it has increased from 11 to 20. It's more difficult than that. There are four best losers in the current program. Yeah. And this is luck. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to again debate. Out of these four, three are from the second set of four. The second set of four is really New York luxury. You need only one vote to be elected, you know, in some cases, okay? So it's tricky, it's a bit anomalous. And, and I do this exercise all the time, just to know what it is. So this is a bit anomalous. And this one also is a bit anomalous because there were three best losers. Okay, there were three best losers. So you have, you have to take it into context. That's one thing. And you can see something which is very important here. Can you, can you lift it a bit? No, no, no. There's a figure here. I'll do it. I mean, the point I'm making is a very simple one. If you look at the statistics here, you can't raise this, please. Yeah. No? So what it shows here, the figure here, in terms of candidate, is 8.5. The figure there is 8.5. Uh, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know. If you don't feel women candidate, we are not going to be elected. Of so we are not going to be we have female, 8.6% female candidate, and 8.6% of female candidates were elected. Okay? So this is what it says here. I don't know why it comes. Next one, please. Now, you can see. Now, it's very clear I will not put Finland, Sweden, of, uh, Norway, and Netherlands, because we know these are very advanced, marching country. Look at Rwanda. You know, I worked in Rwanda for five years. You know, as advisor, I was the chairman of the Wanda Economic Development Board. Pan. <coughs> Ministers there, almost pan. In Parliament, is there. And yet, Wanda is a very poor country. Rwanda came out of genocide. And if they can do it, why can't Mauritius do it? Nicaragua. Again, I, I'm, not, I'm not casting aspersion on countries, but very often, people have a set of values they see that, ah, okay, all right, Norway is Norway. But we're not talking about Norway. We're talking about South Africa. I always tell my friend, you know, look, 
If there's one country that I know very well in South Africa, I just want to say, no, I travel there so often. Can you imagine if you were black and you were a woman in South Africa during apartheid, how this can be? And today, after 20 years, South Africa has 46.3% MP, and I think 48.1% administrators. If they can do that, after what they went through, thank God we did not go through that. So you can see the many countries. I mean, even Maldives, when I say even Maldives, everybody knows what I mean by Maldives, and even UAE. You know, when people talk about culture, I mean, this is BS. You know what BS means? Yes. Okay? So if UAE and Maldives and Tunisia can do it, you know, I could have been mischievous and put more other countries, you know. So this is kind of that this issue about culture, about structure, about uh, people are biased. Look, I think this is just an excuse to prevent women from entering politics. Next one, please. So why are women at the representative? Look, you know, part of my thesis was basically on women. And I wrote a chapter on that. And nothing unchanged. And academically, the trifecta is very clear. The people do. Unwillingness of women, lack of ambition, voters bias, partisan bias. I don't see any evidence of unwillingness and lack of ambition. When I speak to our women, they are very ambitious yeah. and you want to do politics. In fact, I was telling some male friends, I can get to 35 candidates easy. <laughs> they are very ambitious, they are very eager to serve, they are very well qualified, and they are good, if not better, than the men. So, this, I think, I can discard. Voters bias? No. I have, no, I mean, just listen, I, I try to be scientific. I've done this exercise over all the elections. There's not a single case, not a slight case, there's not a single case where women are lost because they are women. There's not. There's not. So there is no bias by electors on women. Women get elected everywhere, you know, in some constituencies. Look, uh, uh, Buddha has always been first until Rana Mirose became by very big majority. We feel that we. The Muslim feel that two novice women in number 13, I number 13, number 11, both got elected. Hmm? In number four, two very young ladies got elected. Two. Two. Okay. Don't exaggerate. <laughs> and in, 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 in number seven, so there is no, I have not seen any bias by voters against women. Definitely exists. There is one marginal case. I don't want to mention it, but you know, at length you come and ask me, I'll tell you. I think she lost more because of the community than basically because of gender. Hmm? You know the case that was in 2010, I think, Ali Moore against Woody. Yeah. In a very difficult yeah. constituency. But I think it was more the community yes. than probably the, the gender. I tried to do this, uh, this analysis. Okay. So it doesn't exist. Parties men's bias? Absolutely yes. yes. So that's, that's what it is. So there's no, there's no evidence. If women are not selected as candidates, and just like if you don't go for the interview, well, in some cases, you don't go to the interview, you do get the job. So the argument of lower ambition and resistance from the voting public, I mean, this is a nonsense. And to me, this is an insult to our intelligence. Mm -hmm. yeah. I will share with you my own experience, you know, as Chairman of one of the largest companies. We have a parity at the board. Our CEO is a woman, 60% of women, and we do a very good job, and we are very profitable. <laughs> so, absolutely not. The argument of culture, history, sociology, societal values, that does stand the test of empirical evidence in Mauritius. In Burundi, maybe. Burundi, some countries, yes, in Chad, I see that. But not in Mauritius, because you know, women. Are being emancipated, women you know are educated, women are professional and they do very well. So I think it's essentially boils down to the policies and practices of political parties, because men are the main reason why this is and again let me be very candid with you. I see that also in the economy. It's a zero sum game. They're only 60. If 
we have to give in to others, it means that they are going to be fewer of those. And all those who make the decision are men. Look at who are going to make the decision. So obviously, there is an element of bias and self-interest in driving this agenda. If you go to Norway, the Prime Minister of Norway is a lady. Yes. The leader of the party is a lady. So obviously you're going to have more ladies. Yes. In Finland also. So there is an element of bias, there is an element, you know, of prejudice, and it's basically this is the reason for the cynical exclusion. And the political system, you know, as Brenner uh, said, uh, is dominated by men. Prejudice against women in politics, and it's a zero sum game. I'm a great believer in, in zero sum game. This happens also in the economy. When you ask people, why don't you open it? And if I open it, my son is not going to be there. My daughter is not going to be there. And then I think you increase the size of the cake, and then the cake is not very good, you know. <laughs> and structure and distribution of power within parties fail on them. So the structure of the party uh, is basically a prejudicial game. And male party leaders prefer to choose male rather than female candidates. They know each other. I mean, they drink the whiskey, the wine, and the cigar. <laughs> so they are coming. Oh God. You know, you know, you know oh I'm just trying, I'm not being really happy to please you, right? This is a submission I made to SAC. This is a submission I made to SAC 23 years ago. And it has to change. Please. Next one. So, I think it matters, you know, again. It's vital for effective and functioning democracy. And first, it's human right. It's closing the democracy deficit. But more importantly, you know, I'm also an economist, you know, beside morality, beside ethics, beside democracy, I think it's about the optimal utilization of resources in the society. We, we, we are going to have a democratic deficit. So it makes sense to optimize the utilization of scarce resources. And women, you know, constitute, you know, a very good source of talent. And they do extremely well. I always tell people, you know, with due respect to my good friend, Mr. Buddha, if the chief justice can be a woman, why not minister of finance? Why not sit in parliament? It doesn't make sense. They're smart. They do very well, you know, in business and in other in other places. So, and I think people have said it differently. Representation is extremely important, you know. Let me be uh, very careful about this. Everywhere in society. You know, I, I wake up and watch CNN and people say that we are not represented. And representation is extremely important everywhere in life. I hear some youngsters, was a lady whose friend was talking to me. He said, many people are not happy with A and B because they don't see themselves represented in the old traditional parties in terms of disruption, in terms of newness, and in terms of new people. And, and let me be honest, it's, it improves decision making for three main reasons, that's we can't think about it. It brings a new perspective to the table. You know, when people tell me what's happening politically, I say, who did you meet on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? I say, Mama, no. It really depends who you meet. If you meet people, you know, who believe just like you, it reinforces your position. So whereas if you are a woman, it brings a different perspective, the substance is different, the emphasis also is different. You know, I've studied the laws in New Zealand when you had a critical mass of women who came in. Even in a context like labor, women are look, uh, men are looking you know, for increased salaries, for promotion, women are looking at work-life balance. You know, whether we are going to have cash, you know, for the children, whether, you know, after school you're going to... So you can see, even on the same topic, the perspective and the emphasis uh, is different. The priorities, I mean, let's be honest, I mean, Premier said it very well. There are some issues that affect women disproportionately during the war. Look at Gaza. It's women and children and babies that are being impacted. Who better to understand their problems, their issues, their sensitivities than these people, instead of outsourcing your representation to men? Yes. Okay, so, so this is also important. And again, uh, studies demonstrate that in very tight political situation, women are better at reaching out, you know, to the other parties and probably men, 
And we see that uh, in many parliament also, where men fight each other in Taiwan or in uh, Zambia and Sand. But I'm not seeing women doing that uh, uh, in parliament. So more women in politics encourages women to contact their own representation and participate more as citizen. Enhance democracy, you said it. And, and, and diversity. I mean, the only difference I would urge you to make, you know, I can speak to many corporates, we need to make the distinction between diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. If we get both, I'll be the happiest man in the world. Yes. But I think you should not sacrifice inclusion at the expense of yeah. diversity. Yeah. So, this is what I told Mr. Sack. I'm a bit ashamed, I'm going to be taking 22 years in pay. So, time is up for lip service, sweet rhetoric, lame excuses, and cynical lack of action. We've heard this before. And you will hear it again. You know, elections are coming, you will say, you know, it's tough. Uh, uh, too many people, uh, too many men around, and whatnot. Bro. So, women's equal participation in politics is key to achieving the sustainable goals. Huh? I think uh, Mrs. Patton uh, mentioned it, and in fact, it's very clear that equality in decision making and women empowerment are integral to each of the 17 SDGs. And there's one SDG 5, which is specific on equality. Now, I always tell my friend, look, again, let's be very calm. You know, there's some good politicians here. We know how choices are made to fill candidates and constituencies. There are two criteria, all of us in this criteria. You try to look at the social demographic of the constituency, and then you try to have an overall balance. But I keep telling my friend, you know, even if it is a Muslim, or if it is a Sani Mauritian, or a GP, or a Hindu, but you have women also that define this kind of thing. They say, ah, oh, yes, yes, we did not realize that. <laughs> so, okay, I, I, I'm really sure that you are going a general population, I mean, let's call it a cat, a vice, or a baby, whatever it is. We all know it is like that. But take a woman. There's no, they, they exist. So I still don't understand, you know, why you can't do that. It doesn't mean that there are only men, you know, that meet this eligibility criteria. So women, why women give the same importance as social demographic? I mean, many can do, but I can't, but I can't accept it. Again, without disrespect to you. Our political leadership made provision for the slightest cohort and sub cohort to be represented. And in case that cohort is not represented, there is a catch up by the Constitution. Yeah. When there wasn't a single of our compatriot, our Samuel Mauritian, who was elected, yes. Mr. Wong was represented. And yet, for 50.5% of the population, when they are grossly underrepresented, there's nothing. And, and, and that's how bad the situation that's how bad the situation is. So you have to recognize the vital contribution to the country. I think that everybody everybody on this. And gender fairness will ensure justice and inclusion, and it will affect the real lives of women and girls. I, I'm a great believer of representation. I have to be honest with you. I don't think representation requires that you give up on quality that you give up on competence. I, I, I refuse to accept this. And let me give you one example. You know, I like this example. I give it everywhere in Africa. When Donald Trump had to choose a woman as judge of the Supreme Court, she chose a woman. She chose a white woman. Okay? And those who did not like the woman, he said, ah, And you know how prejudiced the Americans are all the law. You know, if you don't go to Harvard School Business or anything like that. So she was appointed. Then by the same time, I said, I'm going to appoint a black woman. Everybody said, ah, you're playing politics. He said, but I'm not going to the Walmart supermarket and catch the first black lady and appoint her to the judge of the Supreme Court. She appointed a girl, black woman, Harvard educated, one of the best ones. And you can see the difference between the two. One, you have diversity. The other one, you have diversity and inclusion. And that makes a big difference. And if you don't compromise on quality, she's one of the finest legal minds there. And that's it. But the one, I, I don't believe in this, but in America, they believe you know, you must go to Harvard Law School, Yale Business School, Stanford Business School. And she did good. 
to that place. So I think it's very important to capture this representation matrix. Last one. So, as I say, we're going to wait another 30 years. So, ah, my proposal was exactly the same that I suggested to Mr. Sack 23 years ago. And, and quotas matter, you know. I, I, I'm surprised when people tell me quotas don't matter. If someone can show me a country where quotas have not been introduced and it works, I'll recommend him or her for a Nobel Prize. <laughs> right? It doesn't exist. Right? And, and you know, I've worked on this right, left, and center for 30 years, so it doesn't exist. You need to start this quota. Okay? And they will, they will contribute to address the project. So, what I'm saying is very straightforward. Some people are saying that without reform, we can't do it. And in India, even though they have one member constituency, they are putting 30%. Yes. For us, with three member constituencies, it's very easy. We did it for the municipal election. We can just do it. And the way I frame it here, not more than two percent of the same gender must mm stand. -hmm. Okay? So and that's easy, we can do it. And again, I keep telling my friend in politics, you will find a general population, you will find a Muslim, you will find, you know, even well, within but, the Hindu community, you will find that they exist, they are good, they are there. So you can achieve your overall objective of, you know, and they work and do whatever one person. But at the same time, you know, you uh, reduce the demographic deficit. So I think, I think you can do that. Now, if you are reform, neither gender should represent less than 33% of candidates and party. At least one person of a different gender out of every six to control this candidate. This is to avoid the Belgian trap. You know, in Belgium, they say, you know, we'll give you one third of women, but all the women were down with this. So this is what we call a zip, you know? Yeah. It's a zip. So you need a zip. And then no gender can constitute 33% of ministers, BPS, and other parliamentary. I'm going further. I'm not saying only as candidate and MP, but also as ministers and as BPS and others. Now, this is a transition. After free election, that's the right? After free, that's the reparity. I don't know whether this also can work. Yeah. Uh, after free election, there should be complete parity. You know, when, when Justin Trudeau became prime minister, he had the most diverse, and I like Trudeau because of this. Uh, I'm not saying about his policy, he had the most diverse set of people. So, he had many women, he had I mean, someone told me there are more six were ministers in Canada than in India. Okay? And there were LGBT, there were everybody. And they asked him, he said, Mr. Trudeau, why? He said, look, this is Canada, I don't know which year it was. I think 2019. And the government <coughs> must reflect the country that it manages. Which is true. And in Mauritius also. The government and the parliament must be an equal, must reflect the society that it purports to govern. And you cannot govern a country without fair, equal representation of 50% of the population. I have a twist that I'm not very fond of saying, because I'm not a great fan of the solution. However, for those of you who are interested in pursuing this, Within the existing framework, if people don't want to go for reform, and they say that we have one candidate each constituency, okay, uh, one twist is, again, is until we abolish it, right? it's not for tomorrow, right? let's be honest. I hope we can abolish it and replace it to get representation. We have to say that, look, what is the best user for? It's for underrepresentation of minorities. So you must say that subject to it being a woman. Yes. It's yeah. easy. It's, it's, it's easy. It's, it's, and someone said, oh, this is really genius. I said, well, yes. just have to think about it. And, 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 and everybody would agree. So look, Stefani would have been elected, you know, and Madame uh, what's that? Joy would have been elected. But then you make sure that until you reach parity, at least you get the aid. You get the aid. Now, it doesn't change. It's going to be a general population. It's going to be a Muslim. It's going to be, and usually it's either general population or Muslim. So it's one way of retrieving some partial uh, uh, 
And please, you know, for women, if you can help, but as I say, I'm not a great fan of uh, the best user. I think they are altering the system to represent us. So, you have to decide, do we continue to whistle? And it's nice to whistle, you know, when you have your shower, you know, you whistle, you know, you get some comfort and you like it, but not much happened. So, you will continue. Look, male dominated political parties will continue to ignore the fundamental rights of in politics. Some people will tell you some politicians are not convinced that this is the issue. I like this one. They think it's good, but they don't think it's a priority. Now, if looking after 50.5% of the population is not a priority, I don't know what is the priority. You know? And as I told you, as an economist, you know, I also believe that Mauritius must make the best optimal use of its scarce resources. And these test resources must have voice and must have presence uh, at the table. So uh, you will find, I mean, you will see, you know, the press will report it. Some of my friends will really say, oh, why did you do that? <laughs> I've been saying that since 20 years. <laughs> so I'm not changed, I'm not changed my position. So of course you should continue to do advocacy, training, come on. I can find 30, 35 people. <coughs> We don't need any advocacy. We don't need any training, you know, that will do the job and can deliver in terms of performance. So, you have to fight. And you've got free assets. You've got your voice, you've got your actions, and you've got your vote. And these are the three things that you should do. And you should petition them, you should go and see them. And in no way, it happened, you know, where they threatened. Because the male dominated party did not want to do it. A female, section of the party, you know. Why do you And it's a PR system. And because it's a PR system, the woman won. And today, in, in, in Norway, probably, uh, she left 20 years, who will need a quota for women. So, so you need to start, you need to start somewhere. So, <clears throat> this is all in our ways that they understand. So I think you need to use your voice, you need to use your action, and one of them is what you're doing, it, probably, Probably will advise on the job. I think we can simplify it, just send a link, okay. you know, and then everybody will do that and they will send it. So, good luck. And I hope you can make it, and I hope you will get more voice, more representation, so that we are better and more informed decision about the country. Thank you very much.